It's 12.15, so I guess we should get started. So this is the language evolution session. Uh, my name is Nikhil Badnavin, uh, and we've got two talks here. The first one is Michael Ferguson uh, talking about stability in the Chapel language. All right. So, um, yes, I'm going to talk about language stability. Um, I've already been introduced. You know my name. So what is language stability? Uh, it's a feature of a programming language. It's a guarantee that a valid program in that language will continue to function. And there might be a different definition for valid program, like maybe certain things aren't part of the stable part of the language, but you could still use them if you wanted to. Um, if, if a language doesn't offer language stability, then programmers need to update their code every time the language is released or a new compiler comes out or anything like that. That, that added work could reduce any productivity benefit that the language is providing. Um, generally speaking, the languages in wide use use two different strategies for language stability. One of them is just don't change the language in a way that breaks existing programs, or at least try not to. And the second one is to provide versions of the language that, um, uh, that people can opt into using. So about these, this idea of providing versions of the languages, it doesn't quite solve the problem in its entirety because programmers still need to update to the new version of the language when at some point, right? They, for example, with Python, Python 2 is reaching the end of life. There's lots of Python 2 code out in the world. If that code is gonna continue working in the future, someone will have to update it to Python 3. So the language versioning doesn't completely make the problem go away, but what it does do is it gives programmers the ability to control when they update to the new version of the language. Um, some compilers can even, um, ha you can have a newer version of the compiler that has maybe newer optimizations, and you can ask for an older version of the language. So that's pretty common with C compilers with flags like selecting the C standard. So back to our chapel project, when the chapel project started out uh, development, it started as a, as a research prototype um, in, in 2003, and then eventually made the first public release in 2008. Initially, the focus was just to demonstrate the key differentiating features of chapel, um, like productive parallel and distributed programming and user-defined distributions. So, at that time, language stability wasn't important at all, right? In fact, it, um, it, it, would, it would not have been a good idea to try to stabilize then because uh, things weren't really solid yet. But over time, uh, Chapel has become significantly more uh, usable and performant and the user community has grown. And so now language stability is important to our users. So in the past several years, as Brad was uh, mentioning earlier, we've been working towards language stability. We call this chapels 2.0 sometimes. The 2.0 there refers to a version of the language, not the compiler. We're talking about having a version of the language kind of like C99 is a version of C. The idea is that once the language is stable, the project's not going to commit not to breaking a set of core language features and, and to adopt um, semantic versioning. So why, why is language stability hard? In particular, why is it hard for our project? So like the sort of obvious question is, well, could we have just picked Chapel 114, uh, some release in the past and committed not to change the core features from whatever they did at that release? And, and the, the issue is that doing that would have prevented us from addressing some changes requested by users where uh, the users felt that things were definitely not not in good enough shape, right, um, to, to do this. So there's a, a story about uh, uh, Make, the build system, um, where around the time that the, um, around the time that Make had something like six or a dozen users, um, the author of Make realized that maybe this thing about tab characters behaving differently from space characters was not a good idea. But they already had 10 users, so they didn't want to change it because that would have bro broken people's programs. So in my view, well, you know, in hindsight, maybe it was worth changing it at that time. Um, so if, 
if we uh, stabilize too soon, then we can have problems that people have to live with forever. So there's, there's a balance between um, addressing these user requests and, and stabilizing. So what, what are the changes that are requested by, by our users? So I'm just gonna go through them a little bit right now to introduce them. So the first one is uh, language support for error handling. Some languages do this with um, exceptions. Second one is having a way to use classes without uh, needing to call delete and without just having everything leak memory. Next, we have uh, a request that um, classes can't store uh, nil by default, that you'd have to use a type that opts into being able to store nil. Uh, robust class and record initializer support. In early versions of Chapel, we had a constructor story that was not, uh, not sort of up to par with other uh, languages. A language design that minimizes unnecessary copies and memory errors would be pretty useful. The package manager that enables the community to share libraries. Support for Unicode strings and then making the built-in types and variables either zero-based or one-based and not a mix of the two as they were in earlier versions. So in this next section of the talk, I'm gonna show a series of these charts with these colors in cells. The color indicates, oh, sorry, on the left there, we have the, the, the left column, there's uh, all of these features I just showed you and some other ones I haven't introduced yet. And then on the right, there are these cells with different colors in them. And the color indicates how uh, problematic that area of the language is at that time. And so dark red means it's very problematic and it would prevent people from getting work done. Um, uh, the lighter red means um, it's, it's got problems, but you, know, you could still use it and make progress in your programming. Orange is, it's a little bit addressed and there are still some things remaining. Light green is, it's mostly okay, but we might have some adjustments still to do. And then dark green is, is uh, it's, we think it's stable. So at 114, you can see the picture has a lot of red in it. Um, and the dark red places have to do with arrays. At that time, our arrays leaked memory a lot. So you could go and try to write a program and um, uh, run out of memory and core dump because of these leaks, even though your program was fine. So that's why I colored it dark red, because it would prevent people from sort of doing real work with the language. So in 115, one of the things we did was we looked at uh, addressing this request for delete free programming. So we added these new types owned and shared. Um, but when we did that, we realized, oh, well, we should pro we probably need to have uh, nillable and non-nillable versions of these types. And that's partly due to issues with ownership transfer that I'll show in a second. And so that caused us to realize uh, oh yeah, we have something to do here with class types and nillability. So here's an example of what owned looked like in, in 115. Um, this just declares an own variable and, and, and fills it in. Then on the second line, we are copy initializing into another variable. So the right hand side there will end up storing nil because the model for own variables is that they have a, um, a unique variable is owning the instance. But that's a problem because now there's a new way for this variable to become nil. Are people are going to get confused when they use it later? Uh, there's arguably an increased chance of nil do reference errors from this change. And then the natural question is, could we catch some of these errors at compile time? Um, it's someone, I'm not going to address the typo right now. Uh, I'll just keep going. So, um, so here, we, here we were in 115. What else happened in 115? Well, we made some good progress on initializers, but as you can see, a lot of and, and error handling. But there's still a lot of work to do. In 116, we made some good progress on error handling. That looked like it was mostly going okay. Made some progress on the package manager. Um, on the bottom row, uh, we, we discovered, uh, 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 we an explored some scenarios where libraries changing could cause unexpected changes in behavior in an application. And, and that, 
so we we explored that a little bit and figured out that oh there are things that the language should do to help prevent that so that's why that section became an issue um, so then in uh, 116 around the 116 time frame some of our users <coughs> Brian Dolan <coughs> uh, they uh, they were using the Mason package manager and they demonstrated some problems with the module system so that led us to realize, oh, well, actually it's, the module system isn't quite as, as ready to go as we thought. So I put the um, red square there. So here's a sort of a reduced example of the problem that they were running into. So over here, we've got, we've got two uh, directories, maybe they're Mason packages. They each have a, a, mo a module in them that's supposed to be used. And then there's this help file. And the intention was that this module A is using this help file within its directory, and B is doing the same. But the way the module system works in Chapel, that, that wasn't what was happening. Um, but it led us to, to understand that the module system needed to have a way to distinguish between local and, and global modules, um, or sub-modules and top-level modules. OK, so that's why I colored that square red in this time frame. Um, then we can see in 117 we made some progress on initialization, and then not a whole lot else is, is different. Um, and in 118 we introduced two uh, areas that are, are likely to, if you had code, chapel code around this time, it was likely to break your program. First was moving from constructors to initializers. This was the release where we deprecated constructors. And the second one was moving to uh, managed class types. So first, uh, a sketch of just what it looked like with constructors and initializers. The code on the left is using a constructor. And in this case, it's really easy. You just have to rename it, and then you have an initializer. But there's a lot of other stuff that you might have had to change. And the, the initializers were significantly uh, more capable than constructors. So they're, they're better uh, longer term. But at the very least, people would have had to make uh, sort of name changes. And then in, in that same release, 19, we uh, switched to having managed class types. So on the left is the code that you could have written in 117. And there the class, when you say new on a class, you just had to delete it later. Um, in 118, we changed it so that when you say new, you could say owned or new shared or new unmanaged. And if you say new owned, then the compiler will add the code to delete your class instance. So that was great because it generally removed the need for delete and because it allowed the compiler to catch certain memory errors at compile time. But it uh, caused a lot of uh, sort of uh, disruption in code. OK, so we have those. And then um, we also know that uh, errors that we had in our error handling system are classes. So when we changed all of the um, the class types for delete-free programming, that that caused problems for the error handling. So now this isn't green anymore, right? Um, here's a, an example. Um, on the top, you know, it says throw new invalid argument error. And at the time in 118, that meant throw a new, throw a, um, a local borrow of an owned, and that would have just led to compilation errors. On the bottom, you can see at the time, these uh, uh, classes meant uh, borrowed errors, and then there was no way to wrap an error in another one and throw it. So we had something to do. Um, eventually, we solved that uh, by using own types for the errors. But just in 118, it was uh, identified as a problem. OK, and then you know, other than that, we made some progress on Unicode strings and arrays and loop expressions. And we added some of those checks for um, over, overrides and overloads to help prevent surprising behavior. Then in 119, we cleaned up those uh, error handling issues so the errors are owned now, let you uh, do those patterns I showed. Um, and then we uh, solidified the initializers and made some progress on the package manager. Um, then in 120, there, there, the, um, the change that uh, was most disruptive was that the uh, we we changed the language to make so that class types couldn't store nil by default. And I'll show an example. 
So here's a class type. Um, maybe we initialize a borrowed version of it somehow. And then it, you can't set a uh, uh, like B, you can't make a borrowed C be nil because a borrowed C can't store nil. If you want to store, store nil in it, you'd use borrow C question mark. So all of these cases on the top um, are become errors. And, and note that this second one is the variable is default initialized. So it, we didn't give it an initial value. That's also an error because we don't know what initial value to give now that we can't put nil. So using the non-nillable types by default we thought was good and it was addressing the uh, user request because it helps discover more errors at compile time and it makes the safer code more the default. But like I said, it was, it was a disruption. So that helped get us from, you know, it being a red category though. Um, so that led us to notice that, um, it, as I said, those non-nillable class types can't be default initialized. And it also led us to notice that oh, non-nillable owned variables can't be copy initialized. And I'll show an example. Um, oh yeah, and and so that that caused this uh, this other section to be read. So if you uh, if you haven't caught on yet, I'm sort of emphasizing the times when we were. Um, working on some, one thing and it led us to kind of take a step back in another direction. So here's an example of uh, initialization of a non-nillable variable uh, where maybe it's initialized in a try block. Um, this would be an error in 120 because up here I can't, uh, I can't default initialize this class because it can't store nil. But maybe I wanted to have lots of code in here that my throw and my try block is handling it. So the worker one workaround would have been to um, create a te like a temporary variable that's nillable. But we wanted and needed to have a way to write these kinds of patterns without having to introduce other variables. And then in in um, in the same release, we also had this issue that's qual I'd call it more of a hole in the type system where um, if you had code like this, that line var x equal, var y equals x is doing ownership transfer from x, that leaves x storing nil, but x's type does not permit it to store nil. So we needed a way to fix this type system gap, but we didn't want to just completely forbid this pattern in all cases. Okay. So uh, the way we addressed those particular problems was with new features in one, uh, 121 um, for split initialization and copy initialization. Um, another th thing we did in 121 is we tried to address these module visibility issues. We made them much tighter, uh, modules much tighter, and Lydia is going to talk about these. Um, but just to summarize a little bit, we, we added import statements, we made use statements private by default, and we allowed use and import statements to request relative module paths. And these improvements are, are supporting that original, uh, helping to solve that original problem with Mason packages because the programs now can differentiate between using a sub-module and using a top-level module so that the sub-module names could be the same across different packages. So that helped with our, our modules and visibility case. And then here's the other changes in um, in 121. Like I said, the uh, the initialization and deinitialization part, uh, that red box over here is was fixed by copulation and split initialization. So I didn't show it anywhere in this chart, but then we immediately made uh, the release 122 after 121. We made it in a separate release. Uh, sorry, and 122 just moves the um, built-in types yeah, to use zero-based indexing. We did that based on sort of feedback from our user community. We did it in a separate release to make migrating code easier. Um, so here was our list from earlier in the presentation of changes that had been requested by users. And I colored them green to indicate that we think we've addressed them in a way that can be stable going forward. Um, I wanted to point out, though, that I uh, think back to like earlier when I was talking about the research project, right? We, the research project was 
focused on demonstrating parallelism and distributed programming in Chapel. It didn't so much focus on getting all of these other things to be stable. So we've gone back and done that now, but we haven't needed to change much about the parallelism story. So the next steps, some of these that Brad alluded to, um, we wanna stabilize the standard libraries and adding constrained generics will be a big help to doing that. We wanna address problems with point of instantiation. We wanna improve array initialization. There's the release notes for 121 and 122 have much more detail on both the problems we addressed in 121 and the things that aren't yet stable or that we're planning to look at next. Okay, with that, I will wrap up and it is time for questions. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, so are there questions? I don't currently see anything. Yeah, so let me actually get you started off, Michael. Uh, do you have, is there a plan within the group to do a full review? I mean, I noticed some, you know, colors kept changing, things were green, went red, and then they went back to green. Yes. Is there a plan to do a review of the language as it stands before calling it uh, 2.0? I think we're kind of hoping that people who are using it will give us their feedback to help us kind of collectively do that. I don't think we're planning on having like a giant meeting where we look over the language specification or something like that. Um, we have over the last couple of releases been uh, sort of inventorying known issues and keeping track of which one of these are likely to cause breaking changes. And we've done our best to solve as many of those as we could. So in some ways we've been kind of doing that collectively based on user feedback and our own uh, reactions to using the language um, already. Any more questions? This is one from David. Do you oh, I can, I can read it. It yep. says, what are the possibly preliminary thoughts about array initialization in the absence of nil? So we already can, uh, we already have the language adjusted right now so that if you have an array of say a non-nillable class type, so that's the element type, that can't be default initialized. You have to initialize it somehow. The initialization work that's to do, and the reason that this slot over here on the right is light green, is that the compiler right now is, is default initializing the array and then assigning them. So we had some sort of adjustments to the compiler to allow it to allow this default initialize and assign pattern for classes, but we would like to change it so that it's just initializing the elements in the first place. I hope that answered your question. If not, you can ask another one. <laughs> but I think the very short answer is you can just uh, say, you know, var a array type equals some like loop expression or something like that that is uh, producing these non-nil classes. Brian asks a question. Oh, I, I get to press the, oh, okay. Uh, Brian asked a question, are there any other expected changes in Chapel genericity besides constrained generics, like generic modules maybe? Um, I don't think we have a plan for generic modules right now. I think, you know, maybe one day we would add something like that, but we will const constrain uh, ourselves to do it in a way that doesn't break existing code. Uh, other than that, the point of instantiation stuff I was referring to is connected to how visibility works in generics. I don't feel like I have time to really dive into that issue right now, but it's something we're thinking about how we might be able to improve it so that our unconstrained generics and our constrained generics behave more similarly. Okay. Have, have I, David Wanakot asks, have you thought about how to allow initialization at the point of declaration based on an anonymous function or other code that gets you from indices to values of the types? Yeah, you can just do that with a loop expression. So you'd say like var a colon bracket zero dot dot 20 and bracket equals, oh, you have to put int or some type equals for i and one dot dot 20 and then whatever you want. So that, that, that does that with the, um, the loop expression is, is your anonymous function. Um, 
Uh, Mike Merrill asks, does this include parameterized modules at compile time? I think that might be ref we're referring to the earlier question about generic modules. I don't think we have a plan for um, generic modules right now. All right. Um, I need somebody to tell me how much time I have left for doing questions. You, you've got another, you could probably, you can get Marcos this question too. Okay. Uh, so what's the status of higher order function or Lambda in chapel in comparison to C++ like anonymous function? That's a good question. Uh, right now we are not considering the first class functions to be part of the stable set of the language. The first class functions in chapel right now work for some things. Um, but they, they uh, have some um, parts that need design work. Um, so we don't really know how much they're going to change in order to have that uh, when, when, when we do that design work. Um, I think we might end up with something that's kind of like C++, uh, C++'s anonymous functions. Um, but we, we have to do design work in, in order to kind of answer the question of what needs to happen there. Great. Uh, so let's pause here and thank uh, Michael. Uh, there was a question, uh, Michael, if you're still on, because we've got a few questions. There was a question on the chat about compilation times, which I'm sure everyone wants to know the answer to. Okay, so assuming you can hear me still. The yep. um, the question is, any plans in the pipeline after Chapel 2.0 release to look into the compiler for making compilation times faster, such as parallel compilation? Um, we're hoping in the next sort of several years to revamp the compiler and uh, significantly improve compilation times. I don't really know exactly how, what that's going to look like, but we're planning to have some effort there. Maybe using parallel compilation will be a a uh, helpful strategy. Great. Some other, if I can jump in, some other tools we're looking at there are um, incremental recompilation and separate, recompil separate compilation, which are things that the compiler, as you may know, doesn't have very good support for today. Um, and as Michael said, I think this is uh, definitely a multi-year effort, but it's something we're talking about starting into even this coming release cycle um, before the Chapel 2.0 change occurs. So. Um, I'd like to say slightly optimistically in the next release or two, you should start to see some improvements in compile time and compiler capabilities. Um, again, even either concurrently with or even before Chapel 2.0 is wrapped up. 